the first question that uh, perhaps we should ask <clears throat> is why? Why a philosophy? Do we need a philosophy? Well, I mean, the, the answer is uh, very simple. Of course, for everyday life and for a whole host of everyday operations, of course, you do not need a philosophy. You do these things quite automatically, as people have done for the last, uh, well, 100,000 years. But, you see, philosophy is a kind of thinking which is different to the kind of everyday practical thinking. If you think that the minds of most men and women today in Britain and other countries are absorbed with the immediate demands and the struggle for life. They're obsessed with ideas like, will I be able to pay the rent at the end of the month? Will I have enough money to pay my bills at the end of the month? Will we find a school for our kids? And so on and so forth. This kind of thinking is not philosophical thinking and if you think about it it is rather humiliating that human beings should have their minds absorbed with petty considerations of this nature and problems of this nature philosophy is a different kind of thing because it raises your horizons it raises your mental horizons to think about the big things the big questions the really important questions of life. And by the way, there's very few people that one time or, or another in their life, even the most illiterate uh, person, will have considered these questions. What is the meaning of life? Why, why do we live? You know, we are born, we live, we die, so what? What's the meaning of it? This brings us to the traditional answers, which of course fall into the realm of religion, a life that supposed uh, existence of a life after death and so on and so forth. But these big questions have occupied people's minds right uh, from the beginnings of, of, our, of our species, I would argue. Now, of course, uh, there are people who say, look, I don't have a philosophy. Well, I got news for you. You think you don't have a philosophy? Everybody in this planet has a philosophy. And those who say, I don't have a philosophy, I don't need a philosophy. All that that tells me is that this person will just repeat thoughtlessly, mindlessly, mechanically, like a parrot, the ideas, the religions, the politics, the morality, the prejudices of the society that surrounds them from the moment they are born to the moment they die. Now, if you are satisfied with, with this uh, present society in which we live and its morality and its religion and, and its values then I have nothing further to say to you. You may leave. <laughs> but if, like myself, you're not satisfied and like Karl Marx, even as a young man, you're not satisfied and you want to change the world then you need a philosophy. You need a different philosophy that challenges the existing order of things and its values and its moralities and all the rest of it. And the only consistent revolutionary philosophy that I know of is the philosophy of Marxism, which is known as dialectical materialism. Now, please don't be frightened by, by this. Uh, well, some people are frightened by it. But you see, philosophy, like any other branch of human uh, thought, science, or anything else, any other uh, discipline, if you like, has its own specific terminology, which may be quite different to the everyday use of, of language. For example, uh, materialism and idealism. I mean, if I say to you, somebody is an idealist, well, what sort of uh, impression do you have? You have a man of, or a woman of high ideals who doesn't uh, use bad language, who doesn't uh, uh, eat or drink to excess, who helps old ladies to cross the road, who doesn't kick ki kick the cat and so on and so forth. An idealist, you know. If I say on the other, oh, someone's a materialist, what? Oh, that, then you've got a really horrible impression, you know. So somebody who eats too much, drinks too much, swears too much, commits other bodily excesses which shall be re re remain nameless here, too much, a thoroughly disreputable individual. <clears throat> well, of course, 
that may be so in everyday language, but it's nothing whatsoever to do with the philosophical idea of philosophical idealism and philosophical materialism. The two great schools of thought that have, uh, that have been contained in philosophy from the very beginning, but shall endeavor, if I have time to explain, the difference between the two. Now Karl Marx, and this is the point, this is why we're starting with philosophy, <coughs> Marxism started as a philosophy. The young Karl Marx, before he became a communist, before he became conscious of the need for a revolutionary overturn of society, although he was a revolutionary democrat from the very beginning, when he was a young man like most of you, went to university in Berlin, and he fell under the spell, I can't use any other, he was bowled over. He was bowled over by, by the spell of the ideas of one of the giants of philosophy. Yes, there have been many giants <coughs> over the last 1,300 years, many giants of great thinkers that have really advanced uh, human thought and human civilization. As opposed to today, where there are no giants, I would say. Rather, there's an army of pygmies and dwarfs who inhabit these places, like the hobbits in the Lord of the Rings, they live underground and they've got furry feet, but they're rather attractive little fellows. Not so the modern philosophers, so-called, the bourgeois philosophers, who frankly, and I'm very sorry to disappoint you, those who, who mistakenly have chosen to study philosophy in your university, you made a big mistake, as you'll soon, fi as you'll soon find out. These are mental pygmies who have nothing to say whatsoever. Because the bourgeoisie has got nothing to say. Capitalism, oh, the latest fad now is postmodernism. I won't dwell on that. My friend Daniel will tell you all about that. <laughs> Suffice it to say, a German, a German expression comes into my head. That is kind of philosophy, that's in a Krankheit. That is not a philosophy, it is a sickness. Postmodernism, come on, be, be, be fair. This is rubbish of the first order. And what it shows is they have nothing to say. One of the ideas of, of uh, the postmodern uh, clever people who infest university seminars these days and try to demoralize young people by all the means at their disposal, uh, the idea is, oh no, no ideology. Can't have ideology. Uh, therefore, of course, can't have Marxism. Because Marxism is an ideology. Yes, of course. In the early days, the bourgeoisie had an ideology and it was a revolutionary ideology. It's what created the French Revolution. Even in the English Revolution, that was an ideology of Cromwell and the Puritans and so on. Very courageous people with courageous thought who challenged it. No, no, no more ideology. Why? Because they're not capable. They don't have an ideo ideology. They're pessimistic about the future of their system for obvious reasons. I also am pessimistic about the future of capitalism, not of socialism, however, you know. Oh, yes. What else? Oh, no progress. Can't talk about progress anymore. Yes, of course, because under capitalism there is no progress and there cannot be any progress. That's the reason, but they don't say that. They don't say, oh, no, no, this system is exhausted itself, economically, philosophically, and morally exhausted and bankrupt, and therefore we have no ideas to offer you anymore. That's what they ought to say if they were truthful, but they can't say that. Oh, no, no, no. In general, there's no progress and there's no ideology. But let's leave them alone. In the words of Jesus Christ, let the dead bury their dead. And these are very dead people. Philosophy nowadays has got a very bad reputation, justifiably so. Because philosophy today has got nothing whatsoever to say to the people in this world and the people in this society. And therefore, of course, people regard philosophy with disdain and contempt, well-merited disdain and contempt. Nothing to say to them, but we have nothing to say to philosophy either. Wasn't so in Marx's day. And here's a great paradox. I said that Hegel, this giant, this genius, was one of those towering giants of philosophy of human thought, which uh, the young Marx was very much influenced by his thought. And yet, and yet, paradoxically, one of the great paradoxes, Hegel was politically a conservative whose idea, the absolute idea, was the Prussian state. I won't enter into that. But here's the paradox. This man who was a politically conservative, although, be careful about that, in his youth, Hegel was a supporter of the French Revolution. 
and even I, th I suspect that to a large extent his conservatism was in order to protect himself against arrest under the very repressive regime that existed in Prussia at that time. Yes, but if you read Hegel carefully, here is a very revolutionary idea. It is a dialectical idea. The great contribution of Hegel is that he rescued dialectics, which had been forgotten, neglected since a long time. And this dialectics is the, the heart and soul, not just of Hegel's ideas, it's the heart and soul of Marxism. Without an understanding of dialectics, you won't get very far in your understanding of any other aspect of Marxism. It's all based on Marxist philosophy. So I say dialectics and materialism, dialectical, let's uh, analyze both, uh, if possible, separately, and then we'll try to pull them together. What is dialectics? Well, dialectics, you know, is not a new idea, was not invented by Hegel. As a matter of fact, it is a very ancient idea. You can even see it in a kind of embryonic form, very embryonic form, mystical form, if you like, in some of the early religions, like Hinduism and Buddhism in particular contain the elements of dialectical thought. It's quite, quite interesting. But dialectics as, as, as a scientific uh, idea, was first put forward by the earliest, the earliest Greek philosophers. Philosophies born in Greece. Why? Because up, up until then, all the attempts to explain the universe and nature and the origin of uh, where we come from was religious. In Babylonian thought, and in Egyptian literature, the Hittites, everyone you can imagine, it was religion. The, the Babylonians, the, the creation myth was that Marduk created the world. Well, here were the Greeks. For the first time, a great revolutionary leap in consciousness. Men, it was mainly men at the time, there were some women, but uh, that came a little bit later. Men, for the first time, tried to explain nature in terms only of nature, without having ac uh, uh, access or recourse to any supernatural force or being or gods or goddesses. No, only nature. They were actually materialists. That's what materialism means. People who try to explain nature in terms of nature and nothing else. A great step forward in human thought. One of these great, again, geniuses, people who, by the way, didn't have any of the technology we have today. The Greeks had none of this technology. They didn't have mobile phones or Facebook. Just imagine that. No Facebook. How could they survive without Facebook? You know, or, or uh, any of the other uh, X-rays or any of the other powerful telescopes. No, 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 no. They only had one instrument, the most powerful instrument of all, this, the human brain. Which, and they made astonishing discoveries. They knew that the Earth was round. They, they even measured its circumference quite accurately. Imagine that, with the primitive technology at their disposal. They knew that the, that the sun was molten rock and so on and so on. Marvelous. They even discovered the theory of evolution over a thousand years before Charles Darwin. One of the Greek philosophers, Anaximander, discovered that man had developed from, uh, from a fish because he studied fossils and then human embryos because the human embryo has got all the phases of evolution in it. At one time we had a, a tail and gills and so on before becoming uh, the handsome creatures that we, uh, we now think ourselves to be. <coughs> the great, but one of the greatest of these thinkers was a man called Heraclitus. I suppose he was a bit like Hegel, because Hegel is quite a difficult person to read, but inaccessible. He was known as Heraclitus the Dark, the Dark because his, his, his writings were dark, they were difficult to understand. People couldn't make head or tail of his writings, and he couldn't care less, by the way. I think he, like Hegel, I think, I'm sure, sometimes I think he deliberately wrote an obscure poem. There you are. See what you make of this. I don't care whether you understand me or not. He actually said that, uh, Heraclitus. But uh, what did he say? Well, he said, everything is and is not. Get a load of that. Because everything is in flux. Everything is fluid. That's an astonishing thought. And it flies in the face of common, everyday thought. It is, as they say, counterintuitive. You can't, what do you mean? What do you mean? Everything is fluid. He said, we step and do not step in the same stream. 
No man steps in the same stream twice. You try. You put, the moment you put your toe in, the river's gone. It's no longer the same river as, as what it was. We are and are not. What do you mean? Are and are not. I am me, no? You are you, no? Well, not necessarily. The other day, somebody tried to embarrass me by showing me a photograph of myself as a, as a baby. A rather handsome baby, I thought, but there we are. But uh, you see, this, this baby that I'm looking at, is it me? This baby is gone. It's dead. It doesn't exist anymore. Instead, you've got me. Well, like it or not. May consider to be an improvement or not. But we are constantly changing this, this idea. Everything is fluid. Now, what do you mean everything is fluid? The, the table is not fluid, it's solid. The ground is solid. I am solid. You are solid. Some people are more solid than others. <laughs> okay, so uh, not true. Modern science has demonstrated, and there's no argument about this, this table is not solid. I am not solid. You are not solid. The, this this uh, floor is not solid. We'll deal with that in a moment. On the contrary, everything is precisely fluid and changing, constantly changing. This is the fundamental idea of dialectics. Get your head around that. Everything is constantly changing. Nothing is fixed, ever, but in a constant state of change. This apparently solid table, which is mainly air, by the way, consists of atoms which in turn can be subdivided into subatomic particles in a state of constant motion at, at unimaginable speeds close to the speed of life. You can't see it, but it's there. It's a fact. You know, there's an English proverb. I usually cite this, so excuse me if I repeat myself, you know. As solid as the ground under my feet. Yes, it seems very solid, doesn't it? Very, very comforting. Let, let me make you feel a little bit less comfortable. This ground is not solid. The, uh, beneath the surface, and it's a very thin surface, of rock and earth, there, there's a seething mass of, uh, of molten rock moving at unimaginable temperatures and unimaginable pressures, right? You can't see it, but it's there. And it is seeking a way out. There's a conflict, there's a contradiction between these you know, enormous pressures and the, the earth's surface which is holding it down. But sooner or later, sooner or later, this mass of molten, seething uh, material will find a weak spot in the Earth's surface and suddenly, this will happen suddenly without any warning, they can't predict these things. There will be the most cataclysmic events known to humankind. Earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. The city of San Francisco is based on a, on a fault, we know this, and it's, it's destined to be destroyed. We don't know when, it could be next week, it could be in 10 years' time, but it's... It will be destroyed. We know that. You can't be precise about the timing. So here you have the idea of constant changes. Evolution is, is discovered by Charles Darwin. Showed decisively, although the church did everything in its power to oppose this, by the way. Even in America at this stage, the, the creationist movement is it doing its damnedest to, to, to force American schools, against the Constitution, by the way, not to teach the theories of Darwin, but to teach the theories of the, the first book of Genesis. You know, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and so on. Even today, that's the case. That's the backwardness of consciousness. Yes, but Darwin showed that the, 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 there was evolution. And that, of course, today is demonstrated. There's no argument about this anymore, except to the blindest of the blind. We know, because of the Human Genome Project, which shows that we share our genes. Well, it's been known for some time that the difference between ourselves and bonobo chimpanzees is less than 2%, okay? Less than 2%. But yes, but that 2% is decisive. It's very decisive. It's a leap, a qualitative leap, but I'll deal with that in a moment. Uh, not only with uh, chimpanzees do we share our genes, we share the same genes as fruit flies. How do the creationists explain that? God seemed to have made a bit of a mistake there. Fruit flies and bacteria and, and, and beings more primitive than bacteria. We share our genes with these people. Therefore, there's no argument about this. We are animals, but we're, we're a very particular type of animal. Now then, uh, so that the idea, the fundamental idea of dialectics, the first idea is constant movement. Constant, uninterrupted. Yes, but that's not the end of the matter. 
Nowadays, most educated or semi-educated people will accept the idea of evolution. Yes, but they don't understand evolution. No, because Charles Darwin also didn't understand evolution. That's the fact of the matter. He saw evolution as a gradual, slow change without any sudden uh, leaps. Okay? And uh, that's the idea most people today have got of evolution. Slow, gradual, incremental change. Okay? People can accept that as a comforting idea. No violent explosions, no violent changes. At all. Slow, gradual change. Because in politics that's got a name, hasn't it? Now we begin to see the relevance of philosophy to politics. It's called reformism. You know, the idea that slowly, gradually, peacefully, it is possible to change the capitalist system into something better, something different. Well, not so. Because if you look at human history, for example, yes, you find long periods of peace and slow change, but you also find sudden changes, sudden abrupt changes known as revolutions and wars, similar phenomenon, like the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and so on. And it's these revolutions that actually impel things forward. But let's go back, we're anticipating too much. It isn't just that the, the, the slow change. Yes, nature knows slow changes, but it also knows other kinds of changes, sudden, abrupt, violent changes. That's true of evolution also. Although Darwin couldn't accept it. He, there's one thing we couldn't understand to his, to, his, to, his, to his dying day, he couldn't understand it. A phenomenon known, known as the Cambrian Explosion, which is a very important uh, event, because it's the beginnings of, of, of multicellular complex life forms on Earth. And it happens suddenly. Oh, by the way, when I'm talking about ge geological time, we're talking about many millions of years. And therefore, a su well, I say sudden could, be, a sudden could be half a million years. But that's sudden in the context of geology. And there have been many such violent uh, changes. For example, the, the, the best known is the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs, which paved the way for the rise of new species. That's, that's the point. There are cataclysmic events in evolution, characterized by the disappearance of certain species, which were previously dominant, <coughs> and the emergence of new species from apparently nowhere. Now, Darwin couldn't understand this Cambrian explosion because it didn't fit his, his, his ideas. He said, well, the only possible explanation is that we, we lack the fossil evidence. You get more fossil evidence and we, it will be seen to be a gradual, slow process. Well, not so. In the last uh, 50 years, it was the last 40, 30 years in effect, there's been a revolution in, in the, our understanding of evolution, mainly led by a great American scientist called, unfortunately, deceased, Stephen Jay Gould. I quote him a lot in my book, Reason and Revolt, which deals with these questions. Stephen Jay, Jay Gould did an extensive research into this, into the Burgess Shale in Canada, it's called. And he showed precisely that there are periods, yes, there are long periods of what's known as stasis, where nothing much apparently changes. And suddenly there's a leap, a catastrophic leap. And he proved this, and therefore there's a new theory now, which is generally accepted by uh, paleontologists, which is called the, uh, the, the, the theory of punctuated equilibria. That is, long periods in which apparently nothing happens, then a sudden cataclysmic revolution, because that's what we're talking about here. Let's take it to, an, to another common example, which is the one that's always quoted. You can take water, I just took a sip, you can heat water from 0 degrees centigrade to 100 degrees centigrade. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. That's my phone. Never mind about that. It'll go off eventually. Uh, you can heat water to 100 degrees centigrade, and what occurs? It doesn't gradually turn into uh, something else. It, re it reaches the 100 degrees centigrade, and precisely at that point, it turns, there's a change of state. It, ch it changes into a vapor, steam, which has got different qualities, okay? As a matter of fact, if you continue to heat the vapor to a very high temperature, I've forgotten the actual amount of degrees, but it's a lot, there's a further leap, qualitative leap, into another state, which is plasma, which has got other features. Plasma physics is one of the, uh, one of the important areas of modern uh, physics. Now, you see, 
The same goes when you, when you cool water from 100 degrees centigrade to zero degrees centigrade. What happens? Does it, first of all, in, turn into a paste, and then into a jelly, and then finally it ends up that? No, it doesn't. It remains liquid, the, mo the molecules remain in, a, in the state of a liquid, till precisely zero degrees centigrade. In fact, there's an experiment, I've never seen it done, but I understand it's correct. The scientists can just tap the glass with a rod, and that energy is sufficient to make this, this leap, this qualitative leap, into a solid state, which is ice. Now, what I'm describing here is known in modern physics, and it's a particular branch, an important branch of modern physics, as phase transitions. But to put it in Marx's term, in Hegel's terminology, because Hegel discovered this long before chaos theory was ever thought of, it is the, 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 the transformation of quantity into quality. That is to say, slow, gradual, incremental changes reach a certain critical point where there's an explosion, but there's a sudden uh, development. Workers know this, by the way. Let's, let's see the application of this. You see this in any strike. You can have a factory where this hasn't been a strike for, for 10 years, 20 years maybe, you know, and the workers have accepted everything. They accept uh, wage cuts and uh, they do nothing and they don't react because they're afraid of losing their jobs. And the small minority of activists be lose their, they, become, they go crazy. What the hell is that? Nothing's ever happened, you know, go to the branch meeting, nobody ever comes. Where, where are these people, you know? That could go on for some years. Then suddenly, a strange thing can happen. A small incident, maybe a, a foreman swears at a, at a woman worker, or maybe the tea, tea is cold in the, the canteen. Some trivial incident, or some small incident, and bam, there's a strike. And when there's a strike, you get not a handful of people turning up, you get a, a thousand people turning up at the mass meeting. Angry people demanding solutions. By the way, every strike is a revolution in miniature. That's a, think about that. It's got all the elements, you see all the elements in a revolution, you can see that in a strike. And people become transformed in a strike. They become, instead of the old slave, slavish mentality, servile mentality, passive mentality, they become active participants, active protagonists in the process. That's what a revolution is precisely. Now, what I'm describing to you is, is the dialectical theory, or the dialectical law, of the transformation of quantity into quality. Incidentally, there's another law which you can deduce from that, which is the question of the relationship between, between accident and, and necessity. Necessity, Hegel explains, necessity can express itself through accident. That's what I'm describing. The reason why the workers have suddenly exploded is not because of that trivial incident. That, that's the accident. It's a mere accident. It could have, could have been anything. But the fact that for years and years, a whole series of small impositions, injustices, oppressions, cuts, insults, humiliation, gradually leads to the point where people say, that's enough. No more. It's the, they reach the critical point where quantity becomes transformed into quality, and at that point, even the slightest accident can cause an explosion. Accidents can cause wars. You had the anniversary a couple of years ago of the First World War. It is said that the First World War was caused by the assassination of an Austrian crown prince in Sarajevo by a Bosnian uh, nationalist. Well, not so. That was an accident. In other words, the assassination of that man could have taken what if the assassin would have missed. Would that have avoided the, second, the First World War? It would not. It would have been another accident that would have provoked, because all the conditions for a conflict between the great powers already existed. Now, to go back, how does one define dialectics? Let me tell you the most extraordinary definition of dialectics by Frederick Engels, Marx's great comrade and friend and, com and companion, who, by the way, did arguably more than Marx to develop the philosophical side of Marxism in books, marvelous books like The Dialectics of Nature, particularly anti-during, which you should make an effort to read. Engels says the, the, the following, I read this when I was a young man, and it struck me, dialectics is the general laws, get a load of this, the, general, the most general laws of nature, human society, and human thought. 
Now then, that is some claim. The general nature of, of, of laws of nature, that's the whole universe. Okay? All of nature, all of human history, and all of human thought. Get a load of that. Now, I must make a small confession here. I was about 16 years of age when I read anti During. I was bowled over by it. And I was impressed by the arguments in favor of dialectics. I thought that it was clearly correct. But I must confess one thing. I never believed, it never seemed conceivable to me, that that could ever be proven, and least of all proven mathematically. I didn't think it was possible. I thought it was true, but difficult to prove. You know something? It has been proved in the recent period, not by Marxists, but by bourgeois scientists. There's an enormous, uh, very fertile uh, branch of modern science known as chaos theory and its derivatives, complexity. And also there's an idea called ubiquity, which I'll deal with in a moment, which conclusively demonstrates the correctness of dialectics, and particularly that law of quantity and quality. It's uh, accepted now by, by bourgeois scientists. There's a book which I urge you to get hold of by an American scientist, not a Marxist, an American scientist called Mark Buchanan, Buchanan, called ubiquity. What does ubiquity mean? It's from the Latin word ubique. Who knows Latin here? Put your hand up. No, one person, wonderful. What does ubique mean? Um, like ubiquity is something that exists everywhere. Correct. Ma marvelous, marvelous. Take this communist name. <laughs> uh, yes, but you're the only one. Nobody knows Latin. What's the matter with the education system in this country? In my day, it was compulsory five years of Latin. You know what we used to say when I was a kid at school? Latin is an ancient language, as old as old could be. It killed the ancient Britons, and now it's killing me. <laughs> anyway, that's another, it's, a, it's a fine language. Ubiquity. The name of the book is ubiquity. Ubiquity means everywhere, everywhere. And these, this man, Mark Buchanan, and other scientists have done experiments, and they've discovered that, that, that the most disparate, the most dif different uh, branches of science show the existence of this dialectical law. Let me give you a few examples, and just imagine how different they are. Avalanches, forest fires, heart attacks, the rise and fall of animal populations, the growth of cities, the flow of traffic, stock exchange crises, the outbreak of wars, and I add revolutions, which is the same process, and even new trends in fashion, music, and art. Get a load of that. These, are, uh, show, and this is just a small amount of the vast range of areas where this dialectical law applies, and it's an iron law which knows no, uh, no uh, exceptions. It can be expressed mathematically as an equation which is known as a power law. Now don't ask me what a power law is because I was always bottom of the class in maths. My maths doesn't extend that far. Yeah, but that, the, 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 what I'm trying to impress upon you is the fundamental ideas of dialectics now more than ever, more than in Marx's day, are generally applicable and applied to many scientists at the present time. Well, from dialectics, of course, there are other laws, like the, the unity of opposites, which apply, in other words, that the underlying the whole of nature and the whole of everything else, there's a tension, I use that expression, there's a tension between opposing forces. I, I've already mentioned the tension, the opposing forces between the, the, the surface of the earth and the uh, the, the mass of molten rock which is striving to come out. This is a, a conflict which must be resolved sooner or later. There's all kinds of uh, the unity of opposites. You could even say men and women. It's the, it's the uh, unity of oppos opposites from which we all come through a process of quantity and quality, but that's another matter. The, the, this exists at all levels, from the smallest level, like the, the, the individual atom, where there's a constant struggle between the, the weak force and the strong force, I think it's called. Uh, between the nucleus, which is trying to hold the thing together, and other forces, which is pulling it apart. Okay, and that same process is a tiny level. But it also exists in our sun. A very interesting program on the TV the other day about the origin and the end of the solar system. 
that the center, the core of the sun, the solid core of the sun, is struggling to contain the mass of, uh, of superheated gases which is struggling to burst out and does burst out in solar flares and so on. This is, and th thank goodness it is being contained because we survive on the basis of this. However, in about, I don't want to alarm anybody, but I'm talking about maybe four, four billion years time, when few of us I think will be around. Uh, four billion years time is a long time, but anyway, in four billion years, the, the sun will expand. The, fo the center of the force will be overcome, the center, it, it will expand, absorbing Mercury, Venus and the Earth, the Earth will cease to exist, it will be absorbed, sucked in, into this, uh, and that's, and eventually of course the whole thing will explode, outwards. Do you know who we are by the way we've come from? We are stardust, isn't that a nice poetical idea? We are stardust, yes. We, the Earth, everything are the products of, yes, of an exploding star in the past, a long time ago, exploded, gradually crystallizing into new galaxies, and gradually the, the conditions for life comes into existence. Why do we have iron in our blood? Well, iron is the main component of this explosion of a star. The, the, the content of the Earth's center consists of an iron core, which ex explodes. So we are the creatures of, we come from nature, we'll go back to nature, there's no question about uh, that. But this brings me to the second question. Materialism and idealism. Well, you know, there's always been uh, an idea, you could say a superstition, that th there is something inside us which is separate from our material bodies. Even early uh, primitive society, people believed this. Why did they believe it? Well, it's very simple. If you think, when you're asleep in your beds at night, you, you get up and walk around and do all sorts of incredible things, some of which uh, don't deserve to be mentioned, but there we are. Uh, dreams, dreams. The idea that, oh no, it, uh, what's the explanation of a dream? Well, if I get up and walk around when I'm clearly asleep, everyone tells me I'm asleep, then there must be something in me which does this. And this, this is separate from our material body. It is the soul. You heard of the soul? The soul which is supposed to be separate from the material body. Now, in reality, of course, that is not the case. There is nothing separate from the material uh, body. Uh, we live, the, uh, ideas, imaginings, dreams, you call it what you like, are all the, the product, the mode of existence, if you like, of our material brain, which depends on a material nervous system, which depends on a material body, which depends on food and depends on a material environment. Nevertheless, this, uh, this idealist concept has continued to exist and persist, it's very persistent, and forms the basis of religion. The idea that uh, there's some kind of uh, extraordinary being existing before the world ever existed. This being created the world, you know, in the, in the book of Genesis, God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and so on and so forth. Well, you, you can believe this if you wish. The idealist conception is then translated into philosophy. It's a religious idea, but it becomes, it enters the realm of philosophy. At a certain stage, a Greek philosopher, namely Plato, there were others, but Plato was, was a great thinker, not a great genius, but he, he argued this, he said, what is the nature of the world? What's the fundamental essence of existence? He said, it's form. Everything has form, does it not? We all have form, some more than others, but we have, we have form. Everything has form, it's round, it's square, it's a triangle, circle, whatever. Okay, yes, but if you look at these material forms, these material objects, this, this table is supposed to be a rectangle, but if you look at it, you find that it's imperfect, all kinds of imperfections. And that's true of every material thing, okay? Therefore, he said, there must be a perfect circle somewhere in existence outside of uh, our comprehension, a perfect circle, a perfect triangle, a perfect square, of which this material reality is merely a crude, unsatisfactory Reflection. That's all. Now this, uh, of course, we would say as materialists, is standing with everything on its head. It's the other way around. In other words, what's the, uh, what's the origin of the idea of roundness? Well, long before men and women thought of the word round, 
took them a long time to come to that uh, conclusion. They must have seen many round objects like the sun, the moon, cut a tree in half. It's round and eventually they get, you get the, the abstract uh, roundness, round circle, which doesn't exist in reality, this abstract circle and square and all the other conceptions. All of our ideas, first of all, all our ideas come from a material brain in a material body. Secondly, the content of all our ideas, even the most abstract ideas, also are ultimately derived from, mat from material things. For example, <clears throat> the most abstract of all sciences is, um, I suppose, mathematics. Yes? Some mathematicians imagine this got nothing to do with the physical world. Well, not so. The very word calculus, which is higher mathematics, the very word comes from the Latin word for a stone, a little pebble. It's an abacus. You ever seen anyone counting on an abacus? When I was studying in Russia years ago, they did this with extraordinary speed, you know. I mean, of calculating with moving stones. Then again, why do we count up to 10? What's, the, what's this business about the decimal system? What's so good about counting up to 10? Is it superior? Is, the, is it the best form? No, no. You ask any professional mathematician, he'll tell you it's not the best uh, system. The best system would be based on 12. Because 10 can only be divided by 5 and 2. 12 can be divided by 2, 3, 4 and 6. So it's a superior system. But we persist in insisting on this counting up to 10. Why? You know why. <laughs> yeah. you know, the kids in school you know, cut their fingers. The Roman numerals are fingers. The letter 5 is probably that. You know. Oh, there's one exception, that's the Mayans. They counted up to 20. You know why? Any guesses? They didn't wear shoes. They <laughs> counted their toes as well. You know, in other words, all of our ideas come ultimately from this wonderful material uh, world that we, that we live in. And, and by the way, the idea that God created the world is... Well, you know, modern physics uh, deals with that quite neatly. The most fundamental law of modern physics is uh, the conservation laws. Okay? Conservation laws teach us that matter... And by the way, by matter we don't just mean solid things. Einstein stated, in 1905 he worked out the, the special theory of uh, relativity, that matter and energy are the same. Not similar, they are the same. Light is energy. Now that's, the photons are coming, uh, coming down on me and, and so on. The, and, uh, these, are, these, are, these are material things, these are uh, subatomic particles. Okay, they have mass. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the idea that, that, uh, that uh, matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. That's a fundamental principle of physics. <coughs> fundamental principle. And throughout the whole of eternity, that's a long time, forever and ever, nothing has ever been destroyed. Change, yes, it changes constantly. That's the law of dialectics. Change, one particle can, can become transformed into another particle. But created or destroyed, no, just change, a permanent process of change. Now, once you accept that idea, by the way, it's quite an interesting. Certain things flow from that. God and the devil, heaven and hell, the Virgin Mary and all the other stuff goes flying through the windows. <laughs> Modern technology, isn't it wonderful? You go flat, and you're left, you're left with what? Well, the ideal is we said this horrible, crude, imperfect material world. The sooner we leave this, the better. Yes, religions teach us that. The sooner the, the, that we get rid of this crude material body and return to the soul and to our eternal creator and we'll all be happy forever and ever listening to this dreadful religious music. And if I was God, I'd be fed up with that after 2,000 years, you know. I'd get it every, every day on Radio 3. <laughs> you know, it's, but no, it's a serious point. No, 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 listen, there's one thing you have to understand. We only live once. This wonderful thing, this beautiful thing called life, is only given to us once. And once you understand that, you, you have to live in such a way that your life becomes meaningful 
and worthwhile. No, but for the, for the religious mind, it's different. No, no, this is just a miserable waste of time. Everything is horrible and we are ugly and we are sinful, you know, eternal, especially women. Oh, the women are very sinful. It's in, that's in all religions, are miso profoundly misogynistic. Eve, you know, Adam was quite happy sitting in the Garden of Eden, you know, and he didn't have to work or anything. He wasn't complaining. He was poor chap, you know. Then, then God comes along one night, waits till he's asleep. I mean, that's really unfair, you know. He wasn't consulted about the question. Took a, a rip out of his side, no anesthetic, no nothing, and, <laughs> and, and plants this woman in the garden. And this woman, being a woman, of course, Offers him an apple, and like a fool, he accepts this damned apple, you know. And God was very annoyed about that, and never worked out why he was annoyed, but he was damned annoyed about it anyway. The, 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 the moral of this story, folks, men, never accept apples of strange women. <laughs> you know, and as a result of that, we were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and the rest of the uh, condemned to spend the miserable existence, the men toiling, and the, the women suffering from uh, the men, menopause, menstruation, suffering in childbirth, and stuff like that. Of course, all of these things do have a materialist explanation, but now I'm impinging upon the next session on historical materialism, which is an application of these ideas to society specifically. But to go back to what I was uh, saying, we only live once. And do you really need a paradise? Do you really want to live forever? It's a little bit selfish. We need to leave, leave some space for the new generations, you know. Yes, we're born, we live, we die. We can continue to aspire for immort Im immortality, yes. But the only immortality that we're entitled to is either through our children all through working for, for some great cause, which is higher than ourselves, which will ensure the happiness of future generations. Why should we be so egotistical and so selfish to cling to the last vestiges of life when life is no longer sustainable? No, no, no. We live, if we live a full and useful life, then of course we should be prepared to, sooner or later to, to, to give it up to make room for the new generations. Why not? But it's this great cause that's the point that gives uh, life. And this world, is it really an ugly, crude veil of tears? Well, it shouldn't be. It should not be. This world is beautiful. The blue planet, everyone says this, looking, looking down at this special planet. Well, it's special in this galaxy, it seems. But uh, it's not, spe not special in the universe. This wonderful place full of green plants and oceans, of course. Of course, sooner or later it will cease to exist, but we're talking about four, four billion years, so we can let that take care of itself. Incidentally, this wonderful world and this wonderful life, as Trotsky said, it must be purged of all evil and oppression and exploitation and made fit for human beings to live in and to live their lives in pleasure, in contentment, in happiness, Developing themselves freely, not just uh, having enough food to live upon, but having it also, it's in the Bible, isn't it? Not by bread alone shall man live. That's true. Not by bread alone. It's much more than that that we're fighting. We're fighting for, for, to, to raise humanity to a higher level, a higher spiritual level, if you like, such that life on earth becomes a heaven on earth. We don't need any future heaven. When you're dead, you're dead. You worry, worry about that then. It's too late. But to make this life a beautiful place. And instantly, just one final thought. Engels understood that sooner or later this planet would cease to exist. He knew that. He said, yes, but the life will re-emerge. Life, life always will re-emerge when the conditions are opposite in different planets, in different parts of the universe. So, yeah, we can go a little bit further than Engels. Just think of all that we've achieved in the last, despite the capitalist system and its horrors. Think of all the technological advance, the spaceships and so on. When I was a kid, things you dream of. You know, think you read about the, this in the comics. Dan Dare, he was my hero you know, in the Eagle comet. You know. you better run, there are no, I was disappointed to learn there's no little green men living on, on Venus. There's nothing on Venus. But anyway, things you could only dream of are now a, a fact. This is just in a hundred years. Just imagine if capitalism is abolished and you have a genuine, harmonious, democratic, socialist society which decides the real priorities. Just imagine the sky is the limit. You know, we can make, we can make this world a paradise. 
a paradise in this world. That should be our, uh, our aim. Yes, and when the fi finally the, the, the time comes in, one, we've got one billion years to think about this, folks. I think it's time enough, you know. Think of all the, the technological improvements. And even if the sun does expand, this was this pro interesting program on TV. The life zone will expand outwards to places like Mars and even, uh, even more distant uh, planets. With modern technology, we could probably arrange what our ancestors did when we came out of Africa. A, a migration, only a migration to other parts of the solar system. So even that is not such a fatal ending to the human species. I finished because I've run out of time, not run, not run out of, uh, of material to use. But you see, this is a dream, but it's not a dream. I don't like this expression, oh, it's a dream. A dream is a thing of air, a thing which can't exist, which has no reality, which has no necessity. To what I'm describing to you, it's possible, absolutely possible, 100% possible, on one condition that we carry out this leap, if you like, this qualitative leap, as Engels put it, from, from, from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom, of genuine freedom, for the whole of the human race, a new level of human society, that's the, the vista, that's what we're fighting for, that's the meaning of socialism, and that's the meaning of the life of Karl Marx.